dive into the sinister world of two notorious criminals, Timothy Crotcher and Gordon Northcott, in this chilling video. Scary Facts exposes the haunting stories of these individuals, whose heinous acts shock the world. Explore the shocking details of their crimes, the psychological motivations behind their actions, and the long-lasting impact they had on their victims and society. Uncover the twisted minds of these criminals as we unravel the webs of their crimes, revealing the extent of their depravity. Brace yourself for an unsettling journey into the depths of human darkness as we delve into the chilling stories of Timothy Crotcher and Gordon Northcott. In August of 1977, Brenda Parsh flew from Wisconsin to Cape Girardeau, Missouri, where her parents lived. Her father was hospitalized and recovering from surgery. Brenda was born June 28, 1950, to Floyd and Mary Parsh. She was beautiful and vivacious, becoming a cheerleader in high school. She later became a beauty queen in a pageant in Cape Girardeau. She had ambitions to work in the fashion industry, moving to Wisconsin to be a fashion buyer. As her career was just taking off, this beautiful woman was ripped from the world in a savage attack that also claimed her mother. Mary Evelyn Alexander Parsh was born April 13, 1919, in Alton, Illinois. She married Floyd Parsh, and together they had two daughters. Brenda was the youngest daughter of the couple. Mary was a loving mother and wife. On Friday, August 12, 1977, Mary Parsh left her husband at the hospital to pick up Brenda from the airport. Floyd Parsh said after his wife and daughter failed to show up at the hospital, he called the house. He said Brenda answered but seemed upset and distracted. She said, I love you daddy and then hung up the phone. That was the last time Floyd talked to his daughter. After three days of failing to show up at the hospital, a neighbor went to check on Mary and Brenda Parsh. The neighbor found Brenda and Mary lying face down on the master bed with their hands bound behind their backs. They were both nude and deceased from gunshot wounds. Their bodies had been lying in the house, which did not have air conditioning, for three days in the summer heat. The bodies were already partially decomposed. Authorities believe that the killer must have known the victims. Floyd was hospitalized, so he was quickly eliminated as a suspect. A small caliber slug was recovered from the head of Mary Parsh, St. Louis Post-Dispatch, 1977. Although several items seemed to have been rummaged through, nothing of value was missing. The keys to the house were still in the front door, suggesting the women had been ambushed upon returning home. Detectives suspected that Brenda's ex-boyfriend, whom she just broke up with before moving to Wisconsin, may have been responsible. However, no evidence linked him to the crime. There were also rumors about Brenda's brother-in-law making inappropriate advances towards Brenda. Both men were interrogated, but no evidence linked either man to the crime and both had alibis. The case went cold. On November 17, 1977, 21-year-old Sheila Ellen Cole was found dead in a roadside bathroom stall of Illinois Highway 3 near McClure, Illinois. She had been shot twice in the head. Her autopsy showed no signs of sexual assault, and she did not appear to have been robbed. In fact, her wallet was nearby with cash and checks still inside. There was no suspects or evidence to lead to a suspect in the case. Her case also went cold. Sheila was born on September 15, 1956, in the Crestwood, Missouri area to Harold and Naomi Cole. She was a 1974 graduate of Lindbergh High School and was attending Southeast Missouri State University in Cape Girardeau. She was studying zoology and chemistry, planning to enter graduate school to study marine biology the following year, Manny's J, 1977. The night before her body was found, Sheila had dinner with her boyfriend and then told her roommate she was going to Walmart and Schnucks. No one knew why she was in Illinois. On May 12, 1978, David Witt called police and said his wife had been murdered. When police arrived at the couple's Marion, Illinois home, they found 51-year-old Virginia Witt deceased, lying nude on her bed. Initial observation of the scene indicated that Mrs. Witt had a large wound in her abdomen, apparently caused by a knife slash, and she also had a knife protruding from her chest, Williamson County Detective Keith Odom said, Callison, 
1978. An autopsy determined she died of a combination of choking and stabbing. Virginia Witt was born on August 6, 1926. She married David Witt and the couple were longtime residents of St. Joseph, Missouri. Virginia worked as a dormitory housing clerk at Missouri Western State College before she and her husband moved to Illinois. She had been grocery shopping the morning of her murder and groceries were still lying on the counter when her husband, a Ford Motor Company executive, found her deceased. On March 23, 1979, the new deceased body of 29-year-old Joyce Faith Tharp was found behind a church in Paducah, Kentucky. Her body was found by a florist delivering flowers to the church after she had been reported missing the day before. Her family reported her missing after finding a window broken at her apartment and Joyce was nowhere to be found. An autopsy determined the cause of death to be blunt force trauma to the head and strangulation. She had bruises to her head and neck. She was found nude, suggesting sexual assault. Joyce's case also went cold. Myrtle V. Rupp was found deceased in her Muhlenberg Township, Pennsylvania home on April 17, 1979. The 51-year-old woman had been strangled and her arms and wrists were bound with cord. Mrs. Rupp was discovered by a neighbor after no one had seen her in a few days. An autopsy determined that Myrtle died from strangulation and had also been sexually assaulted. There were no suspects in this case either and it would eventually grow cold. Myrtle V. Ons Rupp was born on April 4, 1928. She married Charles Rupp, but he preceded her in death in 1974. Myrtle was a registered nurse, working as the head nurse and supervisor in the obstetrics and gynecology department at Community General Hospital in Reading, Pennsylvania, Republican and Herald, 1979. 72-year-old Ida White was found with multiple stab wounds on September 7, 1981, in Mount Vernon, Illinois. She was transported to the hospital in serious condition. Her neighbor had heard her screams and came to Ida's home. The elderly woman was in her bathtub with multiple stab wounds to her abdomen. The neighbor saw the perpetrator leave through the bathroom window. Ida later died at the hospital from her injuries. The neighbor described the perpetrator as a black male with a rough face and facial hair. Police were quick to identify a suspect. A man named Grover Thompson was found sleeping across the street at the local post office. He was taken in for questioning and put in a lineup. The lineup was mishandled as Grover was the only suspect shown to the witness. The witness reluctantly identified him although his clothing did not match the description. There were other issues with the case. Grover had a disabled leg, the authorities believed he had jumped out of the window and down five feet. Grover Thompson was a resident of Miami, Florida. He had been traveling from his sister's home in Wisconsin to Mississippi at the time. He stopped in Mount Vernon to rest, falling asleep in the post office lobby. Despite the lack of evidence, Grover Thompson was tried and convicted of the murder of Ida White. She was sentenced to 40 years in prison. Grover died in prison in 1996. Marjorie Margie Call was found deceased in her Cape Girardeau, Missouri, home on January 27, 1982. She was 57 years old. She has been shot with a .38 caliber weapon after being sexually assaulted. It appeared as if the perpetrator had entered her home through a window. The autopsy showed that her cause of death was strangulation, despite the gunshot wound, United Press International, 1982. Margie Louise Call was born July 8, 1924, in Cape Girardeau. She was a bookkeeper for F.W. Woolworth Company for 30 years. She married Ernest Call in 1947 and he preceded her in death in 1978. She was survived by two sons, both living in southern Illinois. There was a suspect in Margie's case, but this person was ruled out before the year was over. Blood evidence was found at the scene, but with no suspect to compare it to, the case went cold. On April 8, 1982, the body of 23-year-old Deborah Renee Shepard was found in her Carbondale, Illinois, apartment. Deborah was one of several young women murdered in the Carbondale area around that time, igniting fear of a serial killer in the area. However, the Carbondale police said, 
there is no connection with any other cases, Wolf, 1982. Deborah was found with no obvious signs of trauma and police originally believed no foul play was involved. In fact, they suggested she may have died of a drug overdose. Her first autopsy, performed in southern Illinois, documented pulmonary edema as the cause of death, Wolf, 1982. However, her family was skeptical and believed that a second autopsy was necessary. It was performed in Chicago before her burial. The second autopsy determined strangulation to be the cause of death. When police originally processed the scene, they noted fluid released from Deborah's mouth that was collected on a piece of clothing nearby. The detectives collected that piece of clothing in hopes that the biological evidence may one day be useful in this case. An article in the Kenosha News in 1982 details the Shepard family's fight to have their daughter's case ruled a homicide. Police relaxed in investigating the young woman's death because they didn't want publicity about another unsolved slaying near the school, Kenosha News, 1982. According to the article, Cook County Medical Examiner found evidence of strangulation and blunt force trauma to the head. Eventually, a coroner's inquest hearing resulted in the death being ruled a homicide. Despite the case being ruled a homicide, detectives were no closer to solving the murder. The murders of several other young women were linked to serial killer John Paul Phillips, but no evidence linked Phillips to Deborah's murder. The case grew cold. On June 21, 1982, Mildred Wallace was found deceased in her Cape Girardeau home. Mildred had been shot with a .32 caliber weapon, much the same as Margie Call. She had also been sexually assaulted. Her cause of death was ruled to be a gunshot wound to the head. Mrs. Wallace had been blindfolded and her hands tied behind her back. Police found a window in her bathroom that appeared to be the entrance point for the intruder. She was found by her sister when the 65-year-old failed to show up for work. Police quickly connected Mildred Wallace's murder to that of Margie Call. However, they were no closer to identifying the perpetrator. For the benefit of this entire area, the offender or offenders must be apprehended and all the legal means to accomplish this task must be utilized, Judge H. A. Sear said, Associated Press, 1982. Although no killer was identified, the crimes just suddenly stopped. In 2007, Carbondale police decided to take another look at the murder of Deborah Shepard. They ran forensic testing on the shirt obtained from the scene on which the fluids from her mouth were collected. The testing revealed a male DNA profile, suggesting an oral sexual assault had occurred. More shocking, the DNA profile was matched to a man who had been in prison since 1983, Timothy Crotch, sir. Timothy was born Timothy Wayne McBride on November 28, 1944, in West Monoy Township, Pennsylvania. His father abandoned him and his mother, so Timothy's mother Fern raised him by herself. She dated frequently and eventually met Bernie Crotch, sir. Fern married Bernie and he legally adopted Timothy, changing his name to Timothy Crotch, sir. At age five, Timothy broke into a neighbor's house. While inside, he destroyed property within the home. He then urinated on the floor. It was a shocking crime demonstrating extreme emotional disturbances in a five-year-old boy. At age six, he was arrested for petty theft of a bicycle. As a young man, Timothy became obsessed sexually with his mother. He also began peeping on neighbors, demonstrating an obsession with voyeurism and exhibitionism. Timothy enlisted in the United States Navy and was in basic training when he met a woman named Barbara. When Barbara became pregnant, Timothy and Barbara married. Timothy was 18 years old when his daughter Charlotte was born in 1963. However, Charlotte would never meet her father as he was in jail for a heinous crime already. In May of 1963, Timothy raped and stabbed a woman using scissors in Waukegan, Illinois. The woman survived and Timothy raped another victim. He was arrested and charged with the rape. While awaiting trial, Barbara left him and gave birth to their daughter. Timothy was convicted and sentenced to 25 to 50 years in the Illinois Department of Corrections. 
Timothy obtained an associate degree while in prison and began working as an inmate emergency medical technician at Cairo Paco Community Hospital in 1974. He also worked for Union County Hospital in Anna, Illinois as an inmate EMT in 1975. He was released from prison in 1976 due to good behavior and was described as a model inmate. Upon his release, he began classes at Southern Illinois University and moved to Carbondale, Illinois. He began working as an ambulance driver with the Jackson County Ambulance. After his release, Timothy began committing numerous burglaries, home invasions, and sexual assaults. During one of these home invasions in 1977, Timothy stole a .38 caliber pistol. He was never suspected of any of those burglaries and continued to work as a first responder. However, in 1979 he was arrested for molesting a 13-year-old girl, his landlord's daughter. He was sentenced to two years for the crime in August of 1979. He was released from prison in 1981. After his second release in 1981, Timothy earned a bachelor's degree in administration of justice from Southern Illinois University where he minored in psychology. He later stated that his studies made him a better criminal. He would continue to commit various rapes, although he was never a suspect. He was arrested in 1983 in Allentown, Pennsylvania when someone reported a suspicious man in the parking lot. He was found with a gun and arrested on a firearms charge. He attempted to escape the Pennsylvania prison that same year, breaking his leg during the attempt. He was convicted of assault and sentenced to five years. Upon his release from the Pennsylvania prison in 1988, Crotcher was transferred to Big Muddy Correctional Center in Southern Illinois to serve sentences for parole violations. He was civilly committed as a sexually dangerous person and confined under those terms in Illinois from 1989 to 2007 when DNA evidence linked him to the murder of Deborah Shepard. When police confronted Timothy Crotcher with the DNA evidence against him, he confessed to murdering Deborah Shepard in 1982. He said he broke in, attempted to force her to perform oral sex, and then strangled her to death. He was charged with first-degree murder and was awaiting trial. News of the cold case being solved after 25 years reached detectives in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. They wanted to speak with Timothy Crotcher. Crotcher initially denied any involvement in any other murders, including those occurring in Cape Girardeau. However, authorities agreed to not seek the death penalty in Missouri if Crotcher told the truth about his crimes. With that promise, he confessed to nine murders, multiple sexual assaults, robberies, and assaults. He said that he didn't know why he chose the victims he did but that he was more likely to kill the women who reminded him of his mother, explaining why he chose elderly women to murder in many cases. In December 2007, Timothy Crotcher was convicted of the murder of Deborah Shepard and was sentenced to 40 years in prison. He was sent to a maximum security prison and classified as a serial killer. He was sentenced to 40 more years in 2008 for the murder of Virginia Witt. He was then given 13 life sentences in Missouri for the murders of Mary Parsh, Brenda Parsh, Sheila Cole, Margie Call, and Mildred Wallace. Sheila Cole had been murdered in Missouri before being dumped in McClure, Illinois, approximately six miles over the border. He confessed to the murder of Joyce Tharp in Kentucky and was also charged with the murder of Myrtle Rupp in Pennsylvania. He received another life sentence in Pennsylvania. After Crotcher's confession to the murder of Ida White, Grover Thompson received a posthumous exoneration from Governor Bruce Rauner. Timothy Crotcher is currently being held at the Pontiac Correctional Center in Illinois. Due to his 80-year Illinois sentence and his indefinite commitment as a sexually dangerous person, Timothy Crotcher does not have a release date. Upon his release in Illinois, he will be transferred to Missouri to serve 13 life sentences. Timothy Crotcher will die behind bars, but that doesn't seem to be enough of a punishment for the monstrous crimes he committed and the 10 lives he took. Before we move on to another story, put a like and subscribe to the channel. And do not forget to give me your opinion, this is important. We move now. On the fateful day of March 10, 1928, a young boy named Walter Collins vanished without a trace. Age 9, 
his last sighting was approximately at 5 p.m., spotted by a neighbor at the intersection of Pasadena Avenue and North Avenue 23, nestled in the heart of Lincoln Heights, Los Angeles. Entrusted with a small sum by his mother, Christine Collins, he set off to indulge in an evening movie at a theater nearby. Meanwhile, his father was serving time for robbery at Folsom State Prison. The Los Angeles Police Department, already neck deep in an investigation for several alleged corruption scandals, found Walter's disappearance to be a disconcerting dent to their reputation. Police Chief James Davis, bearing the brunt of the pressure, was tasked with unraveling the puzzle surrounding the boy's sudden disappearance. A desperate search around Lincoln Park Lake yielded no fruitful results. The boy's father, from behind the bars of his prison cell, pointed fingers at resentful prison inmates, believing their quest for vengeance to be the driving force behind his son's sudden vanishing act. Given his role in the prison's cafeteria, where he was responsible for monitoring and reporting fellow inmates' misconducts, it was plausible that he had rubbed some the wrong way. Despite a flurry of leads pouring in, none proved to be a significant breakthrough. A chilling account came from Richard Strothers, a gas station attendant in Glendale, who claimed to have seen a lifeless boy concealed in newspaper in the back seat of a car. This car belonged to a couple of foreign appearance who had paused to inquire about directions. C.V. Staley, a bystander, took it upon himself to tail the couple. After a brief stop outside the police station, they zoomed off, managing to lose Staley. When presented with Walter's photograph, both Strothers and Staley were positive that the boy in the car was indeed Walter. Other leads hinted at a couple journeying across the state with a captive boy pleading for freedom. Walter's disappearance was not an isolated incident during this period. Two other boys, Nelson and Louis Winslow, aged 10 and 12 respectively, went mysteriously missing on May 16, 1928, while en route to their Pomona residence. A series of peculiar letters received by their parents added to the mystery, the first hinted at an impromptu trip to Mexico, and the second hinted at a bizarre desire to prolong their disappearance to attain fame. The authorities initially failed to perceive any correlation between the perplexing disappearances of Walter Collins and the Winslow boys. Similarly, they did not link these cases to the gruesome discovery of a decapitated Latino boy in La Puente earlier in February. Consequently, a report from a local about a man mistreating a boy on a poultry farm seemed unrelated. Fast forward to August 1928, when police in Illinois found a young boy identifying himself as Arthur Kent. Initially, he only confessed to being abandoned by his father, leading authorities to place him with a foster family. However, with time, he admitted his true identity as Walter Collins from Los Angeles, claiming he had been evasive to safeguard his father. Upon receiving this revelation, the Illinois police promptly contacted their California counterparts, forwarding the boy's photographs and, eventually, the boy himself to Los Angeles. Upon receiving the images, California officials reached out to Christine Collins, presenting her with pictures of the boy allegedly her son. Her immediate reaction was one of denial, insisting the boy was not her son. Yet Captain J.J. Jones persuaded her to take the boy in temporarily, promising to resolve the confusion. Three weeks following this orchestrated reunion, Christine returned to the police station with the boy, armed with Walter's dental records and corroborated statements from those who knew Walter attesting that the boy was an imposter. Rather than acknowledging the evidence, Captain Jones labeled her a madwoman, accusing her of attempting to pawn off her child onto the state and embarrass the police department. In a shocking turn of events, he had her committed to a psychiatric ward in Los Angeles County General Hospital under a Code 12 provision, a law that permitted the police to remove troublemakers by committing them to psychiatric institutions. In September of the same year, a startling piece of information emerged from a Canadian woman named Winifred Clark. She reached out to U.S. authorities, alleging that her nephew had abducted her son, Sanford Wesley Clark, and was holding him captive in California. Jesse Clark, worried for her 15-year-old brother, who had left two years earlier with their then 21-year-old uncle, Gordon Stewart Northcott, resolved to visit Northcott's ranch in Moynville, California to investigate. What she discovered during her brief stay was deeply unsettling, her brother was being abused by their uncle, who seemed to be embroiled in something profoundly sinister. To her horror, 
she too became a target of her uncle's aggression. On the 15th day of September, 1928, a crim confession was extracted from Sanford. He divulged to investigators that his uncle, Northcott, had not only kidnapped him but subjected him to a horrifying ordeal of physical and sexual abuse. He further revealed his forced involvement in witnessing the torture and murder of Walter Collins, Nelson and Louis Winslow, and several other boys, sometimes coerced into participating in these heinous acts. Northcott, he claimed, would kidnap boys, subject them to rape, and when his sadistic amusement waned, he would usher them into a room filled with hatching chicks, only to abruptly end their lives with an axe. In an attempt to erase his horrific deeds, Northcott would douse the victim's remains in quicklime. Sanford further implicated Northcott in the murder of a Latino boy in La Puente. According to him, Walter Collins was murdered because he had witnessed Northcott assist another man in killing his mining partner. Sanford pointed the police towards graves near the chicken coop, purportedly housing the remains of the Winslow brothers and Walter Collins. Indeed, two graves were uncovered, but they held only fragments of bone. Among other farming tools, axes stained with human blood and hair were discovered. The ranch was littered with scattered bones, later identified by pathologists as belonging to male children. Within the house, a library book borrowed in the name of one of the Winslow boys was found, alongside more letters penned to their parents. Other chilling discoveries included a child's whistle and several Boy Scout badges. However, no evidence specifically linked to Walter Collins was unearthed. Northcott's father, Cyrus George Northcott, came forward two days later, confessing that his son had admitted to the murders. But by then, Northcott and his mother, Louise Northcott, had fled the town. T. He Los Angeles Police Department remained stubbornly insistent that Christine Collins had her son, a belief they only abandoned when a handwriting expert, brought in to analyze the writing styles, conclusively determined that the boy's handwriting did not match samples from earlier years. The distinctive R's in the boy's handwriting were indicative of an Illinois education, a style not taught in California. Eventually, the boy confessed. He admitted to assuming several other aliases, revealing that he had chosen to impersonate Walter Collins when someone mentioned a striking resemblance. Arthur Hutchins, a 12-year-old, had adopted Collins' identity in a whimsical bid to venture to Hollywood and meet his idol, the cowboy star, Tom Mix. His stepmother retrieved him from Los Angeles and escorted him back to their home in Illinois. Hutchins showed little remorse for his actions, insinuating that Christine Collins was aware that he wasn't her son, turning the situation into a strange game for both parties. Shortly after Hutchins' departure to his Illinois home, Christine Collins was liberated from the psychiatric institution. On the 20th of September 1928, the long arm of the law finally reached Gordon Stewart Northcott, apprehending him in British Columbia. His mother, Sarah Louise Northcott, was subsequently arrested in Alberta. In a bid to gather further information, the police escorted Northcott back to his infamous ranch in December. During this visit, he made a verbal confession to five murders, including those of the Winslow brothers, Walter Collins, and a Mexican boy named Alvin Gahi. However, later that day, he would pen a written confession acknowledging a single murder, that of Alvin Gahi. Meanwhile, in the same month, Northcott's mother made a shocking confession of her own. She admitted to the murder of Walter Collins, revealing she had struck the fatal blow before burying the boy near the chicken coop. According to Sanford Clark, his grandmother had coerced them into sharing the guilt by each striking the boy, thereby ensuring mutual culpability if they were ever apprehended. For her role in Walter Collins' murder, Sarah Louise Northcott was sentenced to life imprisonment. The trial of Gordon Stewart Northcott commenced in January 1929. Northcott, in a surprising move, dismissed several defense attorneys, opting to represent himself. He confessed to the sexual abuse of young boys, justifying his actions with a claim of love. His mother, called as a witness, dropped a bombshell, asserting that she was in fact his grandmother, the product of her husband's rape of their daughter, Winifred. Northcott also alleged an incestuous relationship with Sarah Louise and accused his father of molestation. His defense strategy was an unorthodox one, betraying his lack of legal expertise. 
Moreover, Sarah Louise's credibility as a witness was questionable, given her inconsistent statements and an evident willingness to do anything for Gordon. The trial concluded on February 8, 1929, with an all-male jury convicting Northcott of the first-degree murders of the Winslow brothers and an unidentified victim. Judge George R. Freeman handed down the death sentence. However, the sentencing brought little solace to the victim's families, who had no bodies to mourn. Northcott met his end on the gallows on October 2, 1930. His execution marked the end of the Wineville Chicken Coop murders, prompting the citizens to sever their connection to the gruesome past by changing the town's name to Miraloma, translating to View from the Hill in Spanish. This renaming allowed the town to distance itself from the horrific legacy of Northcott's poultry farm. As we reach the conclusion of Twisted Tales, we are left with a chilling reminder of the depths of human depravity that can exist within the darkest corners of society. The stories of Timothy Crotcher and Gordon Northcott serve as haunting reminders of the fragility of life and the capacity for evil that can reside within even seemingly ordinary individuals. May their stories continue to serve as cautionary tales, urging us to remain vigilant and committed to justice, while striving to prevent such horrors from ever happening again.